Neither Jenny Jerome Churchill nor Sarah Delano Roosevelt would have considered herself a powerful actor in the patriarchal society in which she lived, where financial and political power belonged to men and women were assessed almost entirely through the male gaze. At the same time, neither of these strong-willed women ever considered herself marginal to the society in which she flourished. Sarah and Jenny were such del delicious op opposites, one so relentlessly old-fashioned, the other so daringly non-traditional. With that and the fame of their sons, they seemed a natural for a double biography. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society in partnership with GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talcott, Director of Literary Programs and producer of the American Inspiration Author Series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of American history, looking at the lives of two American women, as well as at world history, the realm of their politically powerful sons. On your screen is a schedule for our hour long event. Author Charlotte Gray will talk for 20 minutes about her book, Passionate Mothers, Powerful Sons, and share some historical images. Then she'll be joined by moderator James B. Conroy for a conversation about these remarkable people and the time is in which they lived. In the last quarter of our program, Jim will ask Charlotte some of your questions. We got some really good ones in advance and we'll stick mostly to those. But if you have a pressing new question, do put it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we'll see if we can ask one or two. Charlotte Gray is the author of 11 acclaimed books of literary nonfiction, including the recent bestseller, The Promise of Canada. Her book, The Massey Murder, A Maid, Her Master, and the Trial That Shocked a Country, won numerous prizes, including the Toronto Book Award and the Heritage Toronto Book Award. It was also shortlisted for the RBC Taylor Prize, the Ottawa Book Award for Nonfiction, and the Evergreen Award. An adaptation of her bestseller, Gold Diggers, Striking It Rich in the Klondike, was broadcast as a television miniseries. She is an adjunct professor, a research professor in the Department of History at Carleton University, and is the recipient of the Pierre Burton Award for Distinguished Achievement in Popularizing Canadian History. Ms. Gray is a member of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Now, turning to our moderator, James B. Conroy is the award-winning author of The Devils Will Get No Rest, FDR, Churchill, and the Plan That Won the War. He's an honorary fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Mr. Conroy worked on Capitol Hill as a Senate press secretary and a con congressman's chief of staff and served for six years in the Naval Air Reserve. A graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center, he practiced law in Boston until 2020. His first book, Our One Common Country, was a finalist for the prestigious Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. His second book, Lincoln's White House, shared the Lincoln Prize and won the Abraham Lincoln Institute's Annual Book Award. We'll meet Jim later, but for now, Charlotte, welcome. It is, it's great to have you here um, as a mother of two sons. I found your book particularly fascinating. I, I also love the information on New York, the Gilded Age details, particularly with this mini series out. Um, I think also we all know who visit New York often, Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, um, one of its longest roads. It's on every map going back to that era and it just, it keeps going. Um, and I really learned so much about New York, about Paris, about London um, from reading your book. And I really look forward to hearing more. So um, thank you for being here and over to you. It's my pleasure to be here. And Margaret, thank you for that very gracious introduction. Thanks to the American Inspiration Authors Series for inviting me to be here today. And great to see you, Jim, and looking forward to our conversation. 
So I'd like to go straight into my presentation, if I may, because I wanted to tell you why I decided to write about these two women. And the reason was actually pretty simple. They fascinated me. I knew that the lives of these two confident, wealthy women would fascinate others too. Some would be drawn in by their names alone, Churchill, Roosevelt, although it's usually the men with these names who draw the crowds. But I thought that once readers had got into the stories of these two women, they would be drawn into their strong personalities. They'd be intrigued by the choices they made as children, as girls on the cusp of widowhood, on the cusp of adulthood, as young brides, as mothers, as widows. Yes, women today can live dramatically different lives from those of my two subjects. We have far more opportunities and fewer restrictions. But some things don't change. How to choose a life partner, how to face childbirth, the grief and upside of widowhood, and most significantly, how to build a relationship with a child. Because these women helped shape their, their famous sons. As Franklin Roosevelt himself said, to understand properly the greatness or littleness of any man, we must know something of his own life, what went before. But there is more to Jenny Jerome Churchill and Sarah Delano Roosevelt than motherhood. For a start, there's an intriguing coincidence. Both women were born in the same year, 1854, within 60 miles of each other in New York. Their families were comfortably embedded in the creamy gilded society of American pl plutocrats, the one percenters of their time. The women are in the foreground of my book, but I sketch out in the background the slow decline of the British Empire, the rising industrial muscle of the United States, and the long reach of Victorian customs. It was a wealthy, privileged, upper-class life for the two little girls. They were raised with the expectations of their class, that they would learn such graceful arts as music and needlework, that they would move in the right circles and marry well, and that they would never have to earn their own livings or indeed want to. They were insulated from the toils of those on whom their family fortunes rested, including enslaved black Americans, Chinese opium addicts, railroad construction laborers, dock workers. Yet their lives and their choices were completely different. And despite restrictions that seem suffocating to anyone in 21st century North America, each did shape her own life. Each had a very particular kind of power, but more of that later. So let me tell you about my two subjects. Let's start with Jenny and the Jerome family. Jenny was the middle of three daughters born to financier and entrepreneur, Leonard Jerome and his wife, Clara. Neither of Jenny's parents were born into the elite, but Leonard by sheer force of personality and insider dealing took them there. While Jenny was still a little girl, he earned the nickname King of Wall Street. He was well known as a keen daredevil, whipping his four-in-hand coach down Fifth Avenue with his favorite daughter, Jenny, of course, gleefully clutching his arm. Jenny's father built a huge mansion on Madison Avenue with a three-story stable block and a private theater. But it was Jenny's mother, Clara, who shaped Jenny's upbringing. She realized that the Jeromes were simply too nouveau riche for snobbish Manhattan. She did not want her girls tarred by her husband's reckless behavior and frequent infidelities. So when Jenny was 13, Clara took her three daughters to live in Paris, where wealthy Americans were and are always welcome. There, Jenny continued her literary and musical education and also her taste for gorgeous gowns with her dark eyes, adorable curls, flirtatious manner. She was a stunner, fluently bilingual and a witty conversationalist. When she was a teenager, she announced that she wanted to be a concert pianist. And she certainly had both the skill and the stage presence. Her parents were shocked that she dared even to think of having a profession. Sarah Delano's upbringing was even more exotic than Jenny's. Both her parents came from extremely established families and claimed several forebears who'd arrived in North America on the Mayflower in 1620, the ultimate status symbol in 19th century America. So the Delano's sense of entitlement was rock solid 
And unlike Jenny Jerome's family, they assumed they'd be welcome everywhere. And they were. Sarah's father, Warren Delano, was fiercely authoritarian. He had made a fortune in maritime commerce as the representative of a Boston trading house in Canton, today's Guangzhou. He was in what was called the China trade, tea, silk, and opium. When he had made his fortune, he moved to New York and started speculating in the exciting new ventures of an industrializing America, railroad, copper, copper mines, coal mines. His wife, Catherine, was 15 years younger than Warren, and she was the model of sweet-tempered femininity, so valued in Victorian times. Sarah was the Delano's seventh child and the, sixth, and the fifth to survive infancy. Her early years were spent in the pastoral Hudson Valley, an establishment enclave where Warren burnished his upper-class credentials. Yet the Delano wealth was precarious. When the American economy went into a tailspin in the late 1850s, Warren watched his roaring profits turn into strangling debts. He realized he had to return to the China trade and amass another fortune. Sarah's mother made the painful decision to sail east and join him. When Sarah was eight, she and her mother and by now seven siblings made the four month long voyage to meet Warren in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, they lived in an expatriate American society. None of them learned a word of Chinese. Once Warren had recouped his fortune, largely thanks to the opium trade, which was the 19th century equivalent, I'm afraid, of fentanyl sales, the Delanos moved to Paris. By now, Sarah had a striking presence, tall, elegant, and serious. She wasn't as gregarious or lively as Jenny, but she was just as smart, well-read, trilingual, cosmopolitan, and attractive. And here's another coincidence. When the Delanos arrived in Paris, the Jerome family were already there. Both Sarah and Jenny visited the Exposition Universelle of 1867 and both frequently saw the elegant Empress Eugenie, the influential wife of Emperor Napoleon III. The ambitious, strong-minded Eugenie had an outsized influence on her husband, who would prove an ineffective leader. The Prussian Chancellor, Bismarck once described the French empress as the only man in Paris. Neither of those teenage girls would ever forget the empress's allure. By the time they were 14, both Sarah and Jenny were well-traveled, and they were also subliminally aware that women could exert a great deal of power from behind the throne. So in our rather patronizing view of how the lives of privileged women unfolded 150 years ago, we would assume that the next stage for Jenny and Sarah was inevitably marriage. Marriage to suitable, and that means rich and established, partners, probably chosen by their parents. And it is true that both women linked up with the Victorian equivalent of one percenters. But it's also true that in both cases, they shocked their parents with their choices. Jenny Jerome met Lord Randolph Churchill, second son of the Duke of Marlborough, when she was only 19. He had grown up in Blenheim Palace, one of the most magnificent stately homes in Britain. Within three days, this dissolute aristocrat had proposed to her. Despite parental disapproval on both sides, they were married within months. It was a steamy affair. Winston Spencer Churchill was born seven months after the wedding. Jenny Jerome, or Lady Randolph Churchill as she was now known, set about acquiring the codes and attitudes of the British aristocracy and conquering the London social scene. Soon she was very close to Edward, Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's eldest son. The heir to the throne was a man who could never resist a pretty face. He particularly loved Jenny's Parisian style and American wit. Jenny was a smouldering beauty, clever, mu musical, witty, and always eager for new experiences. She was an influencer before the term had been invented. Sarah Delano's choice of husband was equally sudden and unexpected. 
<clears throat> at 26, she had seen destined to spend the rest of her life looking after her parents, and they were happy to have her as a caretaker. But then she met James Roosevelt, a friend of her fa father's and a neighbor in the Hudson Valley. Her parents were confounded when within weeks, she was engaged to this widower, 26 years older than her. In fact, he was double her age. When Sarah became Mrs. James Roosevelt, she did not have to acquire any new skills or habits because she moved only a few miles up in the Hudson Valley to James's country mansion, Springwood, in the village of Hyde Park. Her husband was as entrenched in the American establishment as she was. But James Roosevelt quickly realized that under his new wife's deferential manner, dedicated to his wishes and well-being, there was a will of iron. She was the dominant player in his family and household. So here we have these two young women, newly married and already showing the qualities that would characterize them their whole life. Take their fashion choices, for example. And not such a frivolous example, when a woman was judged, as Edith Wharton makes clear in her novels, largely on her appearance. While in Paris, both women made a point of calling in at the House of Worth, the haute couture fashion house of the day, the equivalent of Dior or Chanel today. Sarah could afford as many goals as she liked, but she rarely bought more than a couple. Jenny went overboard, despite the fact that each gown cost more than a school teacher's annual salary. Sarah watched her budget. Jenny's debts were colossal. And then both women embarked on motherhood. Both women would turn out to be much stronger influences on their sons than the boys' fathers were. But the way that the two women chose to relate to their children could not have been more different. In Winston Churchill's early years, Jenny left most of the childcare to his nanny and then to a series of boarding schools. As Winston famously said, she shone for me like the evening star. I loved her dearly, but at a distance. In letters from boarding school, he implored her to visit him. She rarely went. Winston's biographers have frequently castigated Jenny as an absentee, uncaring parent. But it was not just her love of parties that explains Jenny's absentee behavior. Most wealthy women in this period left the care of small children to nannies and maids. Moreover, there was an additional challenge for Jenny. She soon realized that her brilliant husband was also erratic, unpredictable, and often unpleasant to live with. Lord Randolph had no interest in the welfare of their two sons. He wrote crushingly cruel letters to Winston, so Jenny was often in the position of shielding Winston from her husband's rage. But within a decade of Lord Randolph's marriage, his promising political career did a nosedive and his health began to fail. The love match turned into a nightmare. Only when Jenny's husband died in 1895, probably from syphilis, leaving her a widow of 41, did Jenny have the emotional bandwidth to take a real interest in Winston's welfare. Sarah too was widowed at an early age. Her elderly husband, James, died of heart failure when she was only 46 and their only son, Franklin, was 18. But even before James's death, Sarah had rarely let Franklin out of her sight. She sacked the English nanny that James had hired when Franklin was an infant because she found her too intrusive. She brushed off James's preferred name for their son, Isaac, and insisted he be called after a favorite uncle, Franklin Delano. She wept when she finally cut her five-year-old son, son's long curly hair. And when Franklin went off to Harvard University, Sarah took an apartment in Boston to be near him. In self-defense, Franklin developed solitary habits, such as bird watching and stamp collecting that kept his mother at bay. He did not share his secrets with her. Her happiest moments were when Franklin was a young adult, during their summers together at Campobello, where her son pursued his love of sailing. If Jenny was a distant evening star for Winston, Sarah situated herself 
as an almost smothering security blanket for Franklin, even when he was long past the age when he needed one. As a young widow, Sarah was wealthy, attractive, and eminently marriageable. But from the moment of her husband's death, there was only one man in her life, her son. Then Sarah got the shock of her life. Her beloved son announced he was engaged to his distant cousin, 19-year-old Eleanor Roosevelt. Sarah was going to have to share her boy, but she adapted and quickly took the awkward, anxious young woman under her wing. After the death of Lord Randolph Churchill, Jenny maintained her position in the glamorous world of London society. She was still confident that she was the most beautiful woman in the room, and she usually was. But she also began to take some unconventional initiatives of her own. She founded a literary journal. She outfitted a hospital ship to help British soldiers wounded in the South African war. Sarah stuck mo much closer to home and convention. She now played a large role in the life of her daughter-in-law and her five grandchildren. Eleanor herself had had a rich, wretched childhood and in the early years of her marriage, she was almost pathetically dependent on the formidable Sarah. Sarah helped her organize her household, raise her children and preserve her marriage. So a huge contrast in maternal behaviors. But the two women also had much in common. Both women worked hard to help their sons pursue their political ambitions. Here's Jenny bringing some glamour to Winston's election campaign in 1900. She worked her extraordinary network of connections in the cabinet, in the press, in the army for Winston's career. As Winston himself, himself said, she left no wire unpulled, no stone unturned, no cutlet uncooked. And here's Sarah, happy to ride alongside the newly elected president in 1932. Jenny used her charm and her connections to help Winston. Sarah used her very considerable wealth. She underwrote all FDR's campaign expenses, and when he reached the White House, she paid most of the bills for that busy establishment, since the presidential salary in those days was so small. Both sons were deeply attached to their mothers. Winston would write in a memoir, my mother was everything to me. When he heard that Jenny was dying, he ran through the streets of London in his pajamas, weeping uncontrollably. A sculpted replica of her hand was one of the most precious possessions until his own death 44 years later. The only time that Franklin Roosevelt's staff ever saw him overcome by emotion was after his mother's death. He resisted his wife's attempts to make any changes to Springwood, the Hudson Valley home in which he had, he had been born and his mother had died. He kept it as a shrine to her. And now those powerful sons, whose tactics for dealing with human relationships were first learned in their primal relations with their mothers. In 1941, the two leaders met in Argentia Bay, Newfoundland. Churchill hoped to persuade Roosevelt that America should join the war, and he used all the tactics a valiant charm, forceful reproaches, emotional appeals, that as a child he'd honed in order to catch his charismatic mother's attention. For his part, Roosevelt displayed the warm smile and evasive manner that he had first mastered as a schoolboy to keep his imperious mother at arm's length. Those behaviors, which also characterized their political leadership at home, would continue throughout their relationship, but their tactics for dealing with each other in their unique and critical wartime friendship sprang not only from their innate personalities, they were also changed and shaped by the dynamics of their primal family relationship with their mothers. Thank you. So now I think uh, James Conroy and I are going to have a conversation. Um, I believe, James, you have a terrifying list of questions for me. 
Yeah, I do. Uh, first of all, I, I want to compliment you, Charlotte, on this book. It's really a terrific piece of work, not only in its content, but also in its style. And I really couldn't recommend it more highly. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, let me say this, uh, you know, my own book uh, treats uh, FDR and Churchill at the Casablanca conference in 1943, where they mapped out the offensive strategy that won the war. Um, and uh, that added, of course, another element of interest uh, in my reading of your book. Um, I think what fascinated me the most was the contrast in personalities and lifestyles in these two women. Um, you write, I, I see that uh, no two women could have been a greater contrast in personality. Uh, can you tell us what you liked most and least about each of them? Um, what I liked most about Jenny was her sheer joie de vivre. I mean, she is the person you want to be at a dinner party being entertaining, but she wasn't, she never just talked about herself. She was very good conversationalist. She, um, both men and women really loved her because she took an interest in others and she was lively and she was beautiful and she was thoughtful. What I like least about her is her wild extravagance and the fact that in, she got into so much debt that actually she spent her son's legacy before they realized that uh, they were eligible for their trust funds. And I felt that, you know, her attitude to money was the attitude of only somebody with incredible sense of entitlement. So Jenny is fun to be around. Sarah, I admired enormously for her dignity and for her clear moral sense of what was right and what was wrong and for her um, a, a, a sort of adherence to tradition, which uh, I always enjoy. Uh, but the other side of that, of course, is that she was pretty stuffy. She was um, uh, she was a very different, difficult mother-in-law in many ways, although she was crucial to the Roosevelt children. But she she was somebody who was unbending. I always think of Jenny as belonging to the 20th century and Sarah as belonging to the 18th century. Interesting. Well, that said, given that they both came from Manhattan and were born in the same year and pretty much grew up in the same society in Manhattan, uh, but then chose different lives for themselves after uh, their adolescence. Um, what do you think they would have made of each other? I think that they would never have been friends. Um, and I think that they would probably have seen the worst of each other. Jenny would have seen Sarah as stuck up and, um, sort of with rigid expectations and rather snobbish um, because as I mentioned I mean Sarah was so embedded in the aristocracy uh, whereas and Sarah would have seen Jenny as um, a lightweight or or you know sort of dangerously gregarious and promiscuous and really sort of much too assertive. They did have a lot in common I mentioned you know they both loved fashion and so they would have been very aware of each other, um, but they'd never have been friends. Well, that kind of raises an issue uh, in my mind. Um, given those differences uh, between the two of them, um, if you had the opportunity to sit down for a two hour dinner with one of these women, but not both, which one would you choose and why? I always cheat on this question. It would depend entirely on my mood. If I was in a confident, lighthearted, optimistic frame of mind, of course I'd want to be around Jenny because she would uh, reflect those qualities too. But if I was sort of worried about something and if I was sort of wanted, I had a problem I was trying to deal with, uh, Sarah would be my go-to because, you know, Sarah had a clear sense of right and wrong. Sarah was the person who always had strong opinions. I might not have agreed with her opinions, but at least I get a sense of sort of what the options were. Interesting. Um, following up on that in a way, um, Sarah married at 26, a man as old as her father, where uh, uh, Jenny 
married the second and third time uh, two men who were young enough to be her children. Uh, what does that tell us about them? I think it tells us a lot about them. Sarah loved stability, loved security. Uh, she wasn't sort of looking to stay abreast of fads and fashions. She loved, you know, the Hudson Valley. She loved the sort of quiet life on, on this magnificent estate. Whereas Jenny was always after the latest thing. Jenny wanted to be in the swing of things. Jenny loved um, the uh, parties and the extraordinary extravagance of um, late Victorian, early Edwardian London. And um, she wanted, she didn't want to be, she found being at her in-laws at Blenheim, Blenheim Palace, uh, this marvelous stately home, she found it absolutely deadly. And frankly, it does sound a bit deadly because everybody had to come to, down to dinner dressed and they were meant to stay afterwards playing cards or um, playing the piano or chatting. They weren't allowed to go to bed until about 11 o'clock. And frequently a member of the family would quietly push the hands of the clock forward because it was so boring. They just wanted to get out. Interesting. Uh, you know, many psychi psychiatrists and psychologists say that uh, a mother who dotes on her son uh, is likely to produce a very confident, successful young man, whereas a mother who does not is likely to produce a needy one. Uh, and having read as much as I have about Churchill and FDR, uh, they seem to fit those molds. You know, FDR was confidence personified and uh, Churchill was always looking for attention. Do you think that matches up to their upbringing? I, you know, I, Jim, I'm always a little skeptical about sort of neat little psychological profiles like that, because <laughs> as the mother of three sons myself, I know how different each individual can be. And um, the needs of one child are quite different from the needs of another. Obviously, to some extent, that's absolutely true. Churchill was needy. Everybody agreed he was one of the most emotional leaders they'd ever known. I mean, he cried at the drop of a hat. Whereas FDR had this sort of amazing serenity and um, detachment, which was very much cultivated by his wonderful upbringing at, uh, in Hyde Park. Um, so to some extent it fits. But I think more than that, um, you know, the, both these men as were, were totally adored as children. Um, Winston didn't get his mother's whole attention until his father died, but um, FDR was almost smothered by his mother's attention. And they did tailor their behaviors as youngsters to, um, to deal with such strong personalities. Right. Uh, can we have the one of the two photos that we've picked to discuss come up on the screen, please? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, Charlotte, if you could describe what we're seeing here first and then tell us briefly what you think uh, that photograph tells us about the relationship. This is a photo taken very soon after Eleanor um, married uh, FDR, and it's taken at, in fact, it's actually just before he, they were married, and it's taken at the Roosevelt family vacation home on Campobello Island, which is this marvelous island I visited last summer, um, which is between New Brunswick and Maine, and which is now actually a national park run by both countries. And what you can see in this picture is the all competent Sarah um, looking very directly at Eleanor and Eleanor sort of dressed in white like a Vestal Virgin, sort of looking straight at her, but it's hard to avoid the sense that she's sort of feeling a little like she's in front of a blowtorch because Sarah was so strong in her instructions on how Eleanor should behave and later how Eleanor should raise her children. And Eleanor, who was not in her early years a particularly assertive personality, sort of was too deferential to Sarah in many ways. And at this stage, I have to say, I think she looks a bit like a frightened rabbit. It does indeed. Uh, the next photo, please. 
Can you take us to this one, Charlotte? Well, this is Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill just after they'd married. And um, the first thing that's quite striking about it is uh, Jenny's marvelous dress and lace fichu at the collar. And the fact that she is looking straight at the camera, she understands that um, you know the camera is her friend and she wants to dominate the picture. Lord Randolph Churchill uncharacteristically is sitting at her feet, which is not somewhere he'd usually find himself because he was a bumptious, arrogant young man, and um, but still beautifully dressed in his uh, check suit. Um, and you can see he he was actually sort of fairly good looking, but he had these poppy eyes and this Victorian moustache. And he is, seems actually pretty bored by the undertaking. The other thing that's very typical of Jenny, she has a little dog on her lap and uh, she always had a little dog around her. Um, and she, you could take Lord Randolph out of this picture and it would be still a lovely portrait, but you can't take Jenny away from it. It's, uh, she dominates. Very interesting. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may, about the writing process itself and the art of writing and research in general. Um, I, having read a few of the biographies that you cite in your book, uh, would agree with you that the male biographers of FDR and, and uh, Churchill are both very hard on their mothers. Um, I wonder if you, well, let me, let me add another preamble. You know, there's a growing sentiment in some quarters that it's inappropriate or unproductive for say white people to write about black people's lives or for you know Hispanics to write about Asians lives that you have to be one to know one and write about one um do you think men are capable of writing fairly and and uh, accurately and uh, respectfully about women as biographers I think they're absolutely capable of writing wonderful biographies of women and um I think that uh, you could see it actually not just in biographies, but male novelists can write wonderful novels in which the main character is a female. I, I disagree with the idea that sort of you can only write from your own identity. Um, I think though that these are two special cases in that they do come under very much under the category of great men, Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. And the biographers of great men, by and large, fall in love with their subjects and they want to build them up to be, to justify the title great men. And therefore, you know, sort of mothers in the for early chapters are a bit intrusive. And particularly because some of the great men themselves, including Churchill, like to um, pretend in their own writings that they have sort of emerged fully formed as um, somebody who's going to go places um, and passed off their own mother's influences because they want to get to the main action. That was the case for the Churchill biographies that uh, the biographers want, so admired Churchill. And they really didn't understand what a woman's life was like in the late 19th century. It's a different issue with FDR and the way that his biographers have treated him they were very influenced by what Eleanor wrote about her mother-in-law after both Sarah Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt died. Eleanor died in 1941, Franklin in 1945. And Eleanor subsequently wrote in the next three decades, three memoirs in each of which she was more critical of uh, her mother-in-law who had been a quite uh, dominating um, presence in her life. And Eleanor then became more and more critical and resentful of her mother, mother-in-law, and never really acknowledged that uh, her Sarah had managed to keep the Roosevelt family together and give both Franklin and Eleanor the space to develop their own careers. By the time Eleanor was writing these memoirs, she had sort of dropped the... Um, nervousness and insecurity of her early years and it was a formidable person and achiever herself you know a great champion for peace and for the united nations and for the underdog and uh, so she had acquired a lot of public confidence 
And so she was hugely critical. She, I mean, her reputation just sort of overwhelmed what had happened in those early years. And her criticism of her mother-in-law has infiltrated all the biographies of FDR. Well, uh, before we move on to questions from uh, the audience, uh, I actually have one that overlaps with one of theirs, which may tell us something as well. But um, as a writer, I find the most difficult and the most important part of writing a book, the selection of the topic, you know, finding something interesting, finding something you're going to want to live with for a few years, uh, and that's going to be uh, sellable and important. So all that said, how did you come upon the idea of writing this particular book? And what was that process like? It was a pretty roundabout process. Um, I like writing about women in history. And frankly, it's uh, it's a pretty open field because 90% of the books written about history or bio historical biographies are about men. <clears throat> and there are so many interesting women who have not been written about. Um, and I was looking at um, both Churchill and Roosevelt and realized there was this extraordinary coincidence of them being born in the same year, in the same place, and thinking that it was sort of like a controlled scientific test of um, how you, they could develop so differently, given the same assumptions, the same social class and everything. I have to say that had I realized just how much reading I was going to have to do and work I was going to have to do, I mean, the Churchill alone has over a thousand biographies written about him, and FDR is not far behind. Uh, so it was a, a monumental task. All those books you can see behind me relate to my reading. Uh, but of course, one of the things that happened was that uh, the COVID lockdowns meant I couldn't go anywhere. So I just sat and read. Right. The internet came in handy during COVID in yeah. the writing of both books, I think. Um, okay, so to move to some audience questions, uh, I think there are some, some very good ones. First, uh, would FDR and Winston Churchill have been as successful as they were without the influence of their mothers? They would undoubtedly both have been very successful because they both had that, um, the, they both had the ambition to make a difference in the world and also the egotism that any successful politician needs. But their mothers were immensely helpful in the early stages of their careers. Jenny through her incredible network of connections, which really, really were a springboard for her son's ambition and success and allowed him to make his name very early. And Sarah through her wealth, where she underwrote all FDR's um, expenses. I mean, Sarah didn't really want FDR to go into politics. She thought politics was a dirty business. She wanted him to be sort of a gentleman farmer like his father. And, um, but when FDR ran for, um, first of all, the New York legislature, she uh, paid for the campaign. Once he'd had polio, again, she encouraged him to go back to Hyde Park. She said, no, you can't do any more politics. He was absolutely determined to stay in the game. So again, she provided the finance that was required. So their mothers made it possible for both of them. They both would have gone places. Would they have got to the top? I don't know. No one can, I suppose. Um, you know, uh, Churchill, if anything, was a, a more effective extemporaneous speaker than FDR was. Uh, but uh, he often said that he spent hours and hours writing extemporaneous speeches. Uh, but uh, one of them was given to the House, the, I should say, a joint session of Congress in de late December of 1941, just after Pearl Harbor. And knowing a laugh line when he thought of one, uh, Churchill pretty much started out with the line, if my mother had been British and my father American instead of the other way around, I might have gotten here on my own. Um, with that sort of as a preamble, um, what do you think of uh, Jenny's American origins as an influence on her son, her particular Americanism? I think two things. First of all, that because of Jenny and particularly um, her friendship with a marvelous Irish 
American politician, Bork Cochran. Uh, Winston went to uh, the US when he was very young, he, about 18 or 19, and he um, stayed in Manhattan and he wrote these ecstatic letters back about how he loved um, America, how the energy, the drive, the um, spontaneity, he was given access to all kinds of people and places and just lapped it up. And he always loved the sense of the sort of the new world being a new world, a wonderful uh, place of invention and and self-confidence. So he he fed off that. And in fact, it's interesting. I found several um, references to people who said, well, of course, you know, when he was being particularly lively or activist, people would say, well, that's his American side coming out. Within Britain, it has to be said, it wasn't necessarily such a recommendation. I mean, the snobbery and, the, you know, the parochialism of British politicians then was such that, you know, they said, he's a half-breed because he was uh, not 100% aristocratic British. But he he inherited and he encouraged the uh, the energy that Jenny had brought uh, into the relationship and into uh, into her marriage. Well, you know, one of the audience members has uh, put in a question that strikes me as as provocative and interesting. I'm not quite sure I understand it, but perhaps you will. Uh, and that question is, what was the prime driving force of motherhood for each of these two women? Does that resonate with you? Well, I would put it slightly differently, I think, which is, was motherhood the prime driving force for these women? And it has to be said that for Sarah Roosevelt, it definitely was. She, um, I think, had probably hoped for a larger family, but the birth of Franklin was so difficult that um, she was told she should never have another child. And from that moment on, he was her focus, this uh, precious little boy. This was a time of high child mortality. Several of her nieces and nephews had actually died at a very young age and two, at least two of her siblings. So she wanted to protect him at all costs because she knew he was the only child she was going to have. And I think also, I mean, she was a woman of great energy. There she was living in a great estate in Hyde Park um, in the Hudson Valley. And uh, she, she didn't have a lot of other distractions. So she loved being a mother and she loved shaping her son. Jenny, in contrast, motherhood was not her whole life. Motherhood was important. She loved her two boys, Winston and his younger brother, Jack, but um, she had her own life as well. And she uh, she never sort of, she would always come running when Winston wanted her help, for example, with um, election campaigns. And she always kept in close touch with him. But she was also keen to um, be independent herself. Sarah, for example, never even thought about getting remarried after her husband died. Jenny, as you've mentioned, married again twice uh, to men the same age as Winston, um, just because she wanted to stay in the swing of things. And she really needed a husband to, uh, to give her respectability. Um, well, all of that said, uh, were they good mothers in their own ways? Um, it seems to me they're strikingly different in their approaches, but was each of those approaches commendable or not in your opinion? I I wouldn't bring a lot of value judgments to it because there are many different styles of mothering. I think that, uh, you know, looked at from today's perspective, um, Sarah was a helicopter parent and Jenny was frankly, quite dilatory about parenting in Winston's early years. But uh, they both did give their sons a sense of their destiny. They both did give their sons the confidence that they were important, going to be important men in their societies. They were probably going to be leaders. And that was a very crucial gift in both cases. 
Back to the writing process, if I may. Now, this again is an audience question, uh, an audience member's question, uh, but it overlaps with 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 uh, my thoughts as well. Um, given that COVID was raging when we both wrote these books, actually, um, there were unique challenges presented by that. Uh, but in addition, it's challenging to do a good job with research on anything as as depthy as these subjects. Uh, can you tell us in general, first of all? Uh, how you go about researching and writing a book, any of your books, and then more specifically, was there anything uh, uh, different about the way you approach this, either because of COVID or otherwise? Um, the way I set out to write a book is that I, um, I, I start, I noodle around with various subjects. I see what research materials are available. I, um, also see whether the idea is saleable, whether my publisher will accept it, um, which means coming up with a uh, synopsis of what it's about. And knowing that all my books have required huge amounts of research, as soon as I actually have a contract, I embark on the research. But one of the most important pressures for me is not to think I can do all the research and then write the book, because research is so much the best fun, the fishing expeditions. Uh, of writing a book, and it will always expand to fill the time available. So I always try try writing fairly soon so that uh, I do a, a series of hills rather than suddenly hit Mount Everest and know that I've got three months to complete the manuscript. Yeah. But with this particular book, the problem was COVID because my happiest times are spent in archives looking at the raw materials of biography particularly letters, diaries, um, government documents. And um, I'd already started writing this book when COVID struck. And for two years, I couldn't go to Hyde Park where the FDR papers were or Churchill College or any of the other repositories in England where the Churchill papers are. Um, and I had to write most of it before I actually got to those archives and that was very frustrating. Yeah, we were in the same boat at the same time, actually. Um, the um, uh, the next question from the audience is uh, who, well, start again. If you were to choose an actress to portray each of these women, uh, who, do, who do you think would be a good match for that job? But for anyone who's watched The Crown, I think they might think that might agree with me that Helena Bonham Carter, who played Princess Margaret at one stage in The Crown, <clears throat> she'd be a brilliant Jenny. And then, in fact, for Sarah to sort of reach back through the years, I think that um, it would be a, uh, you know, sort of 1940s actress, um, Grace Kelly, uh, with the dignity and the uh, beauty, the glacial beauty would be a perfect Sarah. The other person, of course, who would play Sarah brilliantly, if for those who love Downton Abbey, Sarah in her later years, would be Maggie Smith, who played mm -hmm. the Dowager Duchess in um, Downton Abbey. Ingrid Bergman occurred to me. Yes, well. lovely idea, lovely idea. Um, by the way, before, last one question from the audience. Um, I don't know if you find this to be true, but people often ask me if I enjoy writing. Reminds me of William F. Buckley saying, I enjoy having written. Uh, but uh, in my case, at least, the research is fun. Uh, the first couple of drafts are are agony, and the polishing up is kind of fun. Does that match up with your with your assessment? Totally. Yeah. First draft blues is uh, a feature of my life. There's always a point when I say to my husband, this is awful. It's not working. I don't think I can finish it. And Why he always says, start this, right? he always says, you say that every time. Right. Uh, okay, well, last one, given the pressure of time and uh, and uh, and the rest. Uh, someone has asked about Blenheim Palace, uh, the place of Churchill's birth. Uh, who was living there at the time? What was his connection to it? And where specifically was he born in that, in that sprawling mansion? The um, Blenheim Palace, which is just outside Oxford, um, was the home of the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough. Um, and Churchill, um, Randolph Churchill was the second son uh, in that family. So he was never going to um, inherit the 
the title Duke, his uh, older brother did. Um, it, it's a magnificent stately home, but at the end of the 19th century, it was in terrible shape. It had been badly built to begin with. It was quite an uncomfortable house. The roof was leaking. There wasn't a single um, flush toilet in it, no bathrooms. That was one of the things that American visitors always found horrendous, uh, how primitive it was. It took something like 80 servants to uh, keep that house going. And one of the reasons that the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough were quite upset when Randolph married Jenny was, they didn't want him to marry an American, but if they he had to marry an American, she should bring a lot of money into the family so they could do some repairs and pay some bills. And Jenny didn't have that kind of money. So um, the Duke and Duchess were quite upset at this um, gorgeous American woman who wasn't going to help the family fortunes at all. Well, with that, all of this is fascinating. It's been uh, it's been terrific to uh, get into it with you at some depth of uh, specificity and generality. I wish you all the best with it. I recommend it highly to everyone who's watching, both for themselves and, and as a gift. And with that, I guess we should uh, turn it back to Margaret. Thanks, thank Jane. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you, Charlotte, um, for your insights and for this cultural education. And we certainly did not have to stand up and turn the clocks back as they did at Blenheim. I love that trick. And um, and what I can say, you know, if this is an experiment, a scientific experiment, um, Charlotte, I, this is just the type of science that I like. And thank you so much for this wonderful book. Um, um, we did get one or two excellent questions, a couple actually, um, and just one of them I want to touch on. And I, I think in your reading at the end, you'll you'll make some of this clear, but um, did Sarah and did Jenny ever meet, actually meet each other? Is you question? know, I was sure that I was going to find in my research evidence that they had. I just couldn't. When I got to the Churchill archives in Cambridge, um, there's a wonderful archivist there who told me that Winston Churchill himself was determined to find evidence that uh, his mother and FDR's mother had met. And he had the prime minister's office ransacking fa family papers to discover whether they'd met. And he couldn't turn up anything either. And he said to me, so Churchill couldn't find any evidence. So Charlotte, I don't think you're going to find any. Yeah, no, I think if M M15 can't find it, neither can you, although... Uh, so, but thank you for trying. And um, and as we do for all our American Inspiration authors and events, we've asked our guest author to share a reading from the book, um, which I just referred to. Charlotte, back to you for that reading. Throughout the summer of 1867, the royal carriage clattered regularly along the Champs-Élysées, the imperial crest on its lacquered doors glinting in the Parisian sunlight. The outriders and postillions in green and gold liveries were as impeccable as the four chestnut horses that drew the vehicle. Bystanders stopped to admire the stylish figure sitting in the carriage, her billowing silk skirts covering the entire width of the street, of the seat. The Empress Eugenie, Spanish-born wife of Emperor Napoleon III, was the celebrity of her century. Among those who watched with awe as the carriage rattled over the cobbles, were two savvy young American girls. Neither would ever forget Eugenie's allure. 13-year-old Jenny Jerome, later to become Lord Randolph Churchill, Lady Randolph Churchill and mother of Winston Churchill, would describe Eugenie as the handsomest woman in Europe. Sarah Delano, the future Mrs. James Roosevelt and mother of Franklin, was a few months younger than Jenny, and she too gazed at the carriage, quote, breathless with admiration. Both girls probably assumed that Eugenie, the beautiful influencer, was doing exactly what was expected of a well-born wife who could have no official role on her own account. She was being an agreeable asset to her husband. Yet the Empress's beauty and elegance had an extra layer, the glimmer of political power, thanks to her sway over her husband, who had ruled France for the past 15 years. Sarah and Jenny would have agreed that Empress Eugenie was a fascinating woman. They were unlikely to agree on much else. Jenny Jerome was captivated by the glorious pageantry of the spectacle.
because Jenny knew the value of a first-rate performance. Sarah Delano would have admitted, would have admired the de demeanor of a woman who embodied imperial majesty. Sarah understood life in terms of duty. In the future, Jenny would use her charisma to secure her own choices. Sarah would shape her destiny through control of her wealth. I decided to write about these two women because I'm fascinated by the way that whatever the restrictions on their lives, women have made choices and shaped the space available to their own purposes. Neither Jenny Jerome Churchill nor Sarah Delano Roosevelt would have considered herself a powerful actor in the patriarchal society in which she lived, where financial and political power belonged to men and women were assessed almost entirely through the male gaze. At the same time, neither of these strong-willed women ever considered herself marginal to the society in which she flourished. Sarah and Jenny were such del delicious op opposites, one so relentlessly old-fashioned, the other so daringly non-traditional. With that and the fame of their sons, they seemed a natural for a double biography. Thank you. Thank you so much for this illuminating evening. So beautifully done. Um, we enjoyed your conversation very much. And to the audience out there in Zoom land, thank you to, we appreciate your interest in America's history. GBH Forum Network does as well. We have some wonderful videos on all sorts of topics and facets of history, thanks to these incredible authors such as you two. Um, from Boston, the Boston area, Jim, myself, GBH, and also from Ottawa, where um, we're delighted that you were able to zoom in. Um, really grateful to you, Charlotte. Um, we wish all of you out there, wherever you are, a good evening, and we hope you'll join us soon again. Thank you for joining us.